crazy enough, I've had four conversations from people in the last week who are from other countries, India, United States, saying, you know what, we're done with Canada. We're not making enough money. It's too expensive here. We're out. What happens first? Do we lose the labor force? Do we have more unemployment? Welcome to The Flow, real estate and money show. A show focused on helping Canadians understand the different elements of real estate, mortgage, and finance. The goal of our show is to provide Canadians with the tools, information, and knowledge to have more success when it comes to their investing and real estate related decisions going forward. My name is Alex McFadden and I'm your host. I can't wait to get you into the flow. Well, we're back and well, it's been about a week as we've had some time to think a little bit about the government's new guidelines and their desire to completely shake up the mortgage industry and ideally real estate industry. And well, we've got some thoughts, we've got some considerations and we got some more to unpack well, if you haven't been reading on every single Instagram account or Twitter account or Facebook account or news article everywhere in the country, because while well, we all made sure everywhere it was known, there has been a significant move from the government to completely change how the mortgage insurance works for both existing buyers and first time buyers, more on first time buyers as we unpack this episode. But before we get into breaking that down, because you might have already watched one of our previous videos, this video isn't necessarily going to be just about breaking down what happened. We're going to talk about the impacts and what they did not tell us that could impact people in the future, because there were a lot of left out pieces of information that should have been included in that announcement, unsurprisingly. In addition to that, there was a big move in the United States down in, what was this, on September 18th, as we've been waiting for anybody who knows or follows interest rates or just the entire financial system in North America knows that the Fed had a huge announcement and they surprised the vast majority of speculators and economists who were mostly predicting a quarter point rate drop with a huge 50 basis points. So essentially, Jerome Powell came out swinging. So I'm going to unpack a little bit about that here. And more importantly, what's happening in the mortgage world and rate market. So for today's conversation, we're going to keep things pretty topical about what's been happening in the rate market. Are things changing on the fixed and the variable, variable rate market? And is there a strategy that you're not thinking about that could impact you when it comes to your financing, especially in a declining rate environment like where it is right now? You see, what I'm noticing is a lot of people are reporting and posting videos and content about what's happening, but they're not taking the time to unpack why it might be happening, but more importantly, how you should strategize in these situations, whether it be someone who is renewing, renewing their mortgage and thinking about making a move in the next couple of years or just genuinely trying to figure out what do I do right now in a declining rate environment? I'm going to unpack these three points. And if you stay to the end, there's a, a good key point and strategy that most people are not thinking about. One that I think some people should be taking advantage of, especially if they're coming up for renewal or considering a refinance in the declining rate environment. But first, before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about these CMHC changes and how it's going to impact people. Of course, what they left out. Now, by the way, if you're enjoying this podcast, make sure to give me a subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're on Spotify, hit that like button and share it out because that's how we definitely connect and help more people. If you're liking what you have to hear, hit me up on Instagram at Flow Mortgage Co. or at The Mortgage Pug is where you can find me, where I post daily content in the live showing real life situations and examples with no bullshit. So, Without further ado, let's talk about it. We know there were three big changes that the CMHC, or the government announced for CMHC insured mortgages, one bigger than the other, but they're all pretty damn impactful. Let's start off. So the execs looking at down payments are sitting there wondering, what is this going to mean in the marketplace with the down payment requirements change for properties up to $1.5 million? What am I talking about? In fact, I'm talking about the ability that you can now purchase a property up to $1.5 million with less than 20% down. And this is a significant change because the last time they changed these rules and guidelines was 2012. And best believe property values have surely changed dramatically, especially in the cities, in the country's major cities, Vancouver and Toronto. I mean, the average price point in most cities across the country or many major cities is over a million. And this stat actually surprised me. I looked and noticed that Delta is the number one city with listings. Delta BC, number one city with listings over a million dollars in the country, which is crazy, followed by no surprise Vancouver and other cities beyond that. That being said, the question mark is, 
are people going to still put down less than 20% on properties of up to $1.5 million? And for those properties of up to $1.5 million, what will the down payment look like? Let me give, break down exactly what I mean. If you don't already know this, you if you put down you know, minimum down payment on a property that's $900,000, how it works is you have to put down 5% of the first 500, that's 25K. And for the extra 400K, you have to actually put down 10% because it's 10% of the amount above that, which means you have to put down the 25 and the 40, $65,000 on that minimum amount above $500,000. So the question many are asking is, well, is that same rule going to apply for purchase prices of up to $1.5 million? Example, if it was five and then 10 and your purchase price of your property was uh, just under 1.5 million, that would give you a down payment of about $125,000. The question many are asking is, are they gonna do another increase for the amount above a million dollars? to make things just more complicated and confusing. It looks like no at this time right now, but we wouldn't be surprised to see them make some adjustments to the minimum down payment at that time. Ultimately, it's still a pretty decent down payment amount. And I don't think there's going to be a significant amount of people running over to the markets right now to go ahead and purchase properties above a million dollars and less, with less than 20% down because the down payment itself on that amount is, or the income required on that million dollars is massive, nearly a quarter million dollars, depending on your overall income situation and what your qualification guidelines are. Either way, it's not something that's going to go in and change the market right away and get more people to start buying homes above a million dollars. But what this could mean is, in fact, there could be a big impact on insurance premiums and portfolio insurance. Now, if you don't already know this, basically there's three kind of camps of mortgages. There's less than 20% down. It's an insured mortgage where the borrower is paying for CMHC insurance. There's a middle of the pack, which is an insurable loan. That's somebody who qualifies under the insurer guidelines, which previously you could put 20% down and still qualify under insurable loan as long as it was 25 years or under a million bucks. Now that category actually opens up and insurable guidelines can actually work out in the favor of someone who's looking at actually purchasing a property under $1.5 million with uh, less than 20% down or more than 20% down. This will definitely have an impact on the lending market and the banking market, no doubt, because the, the non-bank lenders, as you may know, have to basically back their mortgages with insurance. It's called portfolio insurance through CMHC Sagan or uh, Canada Guarantee. So basically, in short, you're going to see more comp competition for purchase prices and loans of up to $1.5 million price points now where you didn't see that before. And there's no doubt that that's going to be a good thing for consumers because you, it, basically it means lower interest rates is, are going to come now because of their ability to start insuring. Now, they haven't given us all the rules and guidelines on how that is going to work. But at this point right now, we can assume not only is that going to benefit from a lending perspective and a competition perspective for non-bank lenders, but you're also going to see the benefit for people who had previously insured mortgages. Let's say you bought a home for 800K with you know 15% down and now it's worth 1.1 and you'd like to switch to a different institution. There's going to be more lending opportunities and more options available, which is going to be good for rates and terms at completion. A lot of people don't know about this. So it's definitely something worth looking into and thinking about because most are only looking at the purchase side of this equation. Now, another question that we want to ask ourselves are, is the premium going to increase for property values above a million bucks? So right now you have to pay 4% insurance on a purchase price or with 5% down payment. But if you were to put down in this case over a million dollars, does that premium go up to four and a quarter or 4.5%? The answer is we don't know yet, but at this point, we would predict that they probably would r rise a little bit or remain pretty much the same on anything above a million dollars, because at that point, you're putting down more than 10%. They already have an insurance premium for 30-year amortization, so it wouldn't be shocking to see a little bit of an adjustment there, but it definitely will open things up. Now, the question for many is going to be like, okay, so we talked about the three camps of mortgages, and if I lost you there, stay on. We got you here. Basically, the question mark is, does this impact the uninsured market, which is where the big banks basically dominate? They really dominate that market because they have access to lower cost funds when compared to the non-bank lenders. Basically, the portfolios of the big six banks are virtually all uninsured. Well, there's going to be a few things that we should see as repercussions or impacts of this. Number one, right off the bat, there's no negative impact per se to the banks in the way that they are insuring their mortgages or not insuring them per se, but there's going to be more competition in that space up to 1.5 million bucks, which means basically better rates and terms, means it's going to eat into some of the bank margins. And I think the other impact of that is that's going to make sure that the banks are more competitive, not just on uninsured loans, 
but they're going to start being more competitive on insured loans, which is great for me as a partner of many of the banks. We can offer our clients better terms and better options, and it's going to put them in their place as we've already seen this year competition really ramp up. Now, as far as competition, we'll touch on that when we get into the rate part of this conversation. But genuinely speaking, I, I do believe that you're going to see uh, more competition from all markets and strategy at the end of the day. All these all these lenders are going to offer great options. So the question mark is, what is the strategy? And so that's what we're going to be considering here, kind of looking forward if you're a consumer, because they're all going to be with such with within like such a small margin. I mean, one bank might offer you 0.1% difference or 0.2% difference. It's not a significant difference when you're looking at the complexity of a mortgage and all the different considerations that are there. But one of my predictions is not only will rates have lower margins, which will impact all parties, including myself as a, a mortgage professional, but I do believe that you're going to see a lot more banks and lenders specialize more specifically on different types of loan programs or clientele, especially like we see this a lot in the United States where there's much more specialized type of lending and programs. And I do believe that this is going to be one of the byproducts of these types of changes looking forward. Now, as far as the criteria, like to be eligible for an insured mortgage, we don't anticipate there being a, a significant change in, in your ability to qualify. So it should be the same. And as a first time buyer, you, you know, basically the government says in the federal guidelines that if you haven't owned a home for four years, you could be considered a first time buyer as well again. So that's obviously beneficial from that perspective. Now, considering looking at how many people are actually going to take up a lot of the room as far as these guidelines are concerned and what is that going to look like? And we haven't even touched on the 30 year incentive uh, consideration. Let's touch on that really briefly. If you are somebody who's purchasing a property and you're a first time buyer, you can now do a 30 year amortization on any property type, whether it be resale or pre-sale. Obviously this doesn't extend to properties that are not insurable, but like if you're buying like a typical condo, detached house, townhome, something of that nature, and the insurers will, will qualify it, then you can actually do a 30 year amortization, which will have a big impact on people's not only ability to budget accordingly, but ability to spread out their costs and, and risks, as well as qualify for up to 10% more money. So, I mean, that's relatively significant, but you know, of course the question mark is how many people are going to fall into that, that, that market. Uh, looking at some of the stats here at this point right now, there's only 19% of the entire market is insured first time buyers. So going ahead and putting 30 year amortizations is probably not going to shake up the entire marketplace, though it will have an impact on the overall market. And get this, because now if you're a any buyer, not even a first time buyer, and you're purchasing a property, you can qualify for a 30 year amortization. But the crazy stats on that is only 4% of new purchase properties, according to statistics, 4% of new purchases are in insured market, which basically means that 96% of the marketplace is buying new builds, is buying with 20% down or more. So not likely to have a significant difference, but definitely will have a minor impact on some of those who are a little bit on the edge and maybe we're trading off based on purely price point and qualification who are already previous buyers. Now, as for that million dollar loan mark price point that we're talking about right now, raising the limit, again, it might have a greater impact in some locations than others think. And I think that purely comes down to the location. You know, working with clients in BC, Alberta, and Ontario, we've got the opportunity to see people in different financial situations and work situations. But we cannot remember there are a lot of people who either come out of university or have built successful businesses or whatever it might be. And they've opted not to purchase a home until, let's say, their 30s when they're making a sizable amount of income, but haven't been able to save the down payment because they put all their money into their student loans or into their business, those types of people can actually qualify based on their income. They just haven't had the ability to save up the money yet. And so there's definitely a significant impact on people's ability to qualify based on that under $1 million guidelines. And so there definitely are some cities that we're going to start to see a greater impact than others. I mean, notwithstanding what I mentioned before about Delta and Vancouver, some of the interesting ones right after that are Oakville, Ontario, Richmond Hill, Ontario, Richmond, BC, Newmarket, North Vancouver, Maple Ridge, BC, and then it goes on and on. So it's predominantly British Columbia and Ontario markets. But in all these uh, 15 uh, markets right here that I've I've got, and we'll put this on the, on the slides here, everywhere from 50% to 80% of the homes in the marketplace are for sale for over a million dollars, which is actually crazy. Now, for those people who are considering unique opportunities to basically whether they have 20% down and maybe they qualify, should I use that money? There are some unique strategies that you can consider. Speaking of strategies, I mean, some people could be savvy in the way that they do things and say, okay, on a $1.5 million purchase price, I'm going to go ahead 
and pay for that insurance, which will cost you almost $58,000. And I'll put down $125,000 in this case, assuming you qualify. Remember, you can qualify with up to four applicants. So this means that the four applicants can go together on this. And then ultimately they've got, let's say $175,000 of down payment left over because the insurance you don't have to pay up front. This means that at this point, that 175 is money that you could put into something else. Let's say they take that $175,000 of down payment and invest it into something else. They could invest it into another property, an investment property, or into the markets themselves based on a minimum of 4% return. And I'm going to take this hat tip this over to our friend Rob McLister, who did the math on this. But at a 4% return over five years, that's $38,000 less inflation and taxes. And so there are different ways that you could diversify that money and look for opportunities, moreover, just being an insured mortgage, right? The other thing is obviously there is a significant difference in interest rates for an insured mortgage. It's basically a 50 point difference if you're doing an uninsured mortgage versus insured, which over five years could equate to as much as thirty to $40,000. And the, the uh, and the associated premium, which means ultimately there's an additional actually savings both during the term. So when you consider the insurance fee, assuming you can comfortably pay for that mortgage payment, but over and above that, when you get to the end at the renewal, and a lot of people don't realize this because you have an insured mortgage, you are eligible for better terms at renewal than other people, which is one of the faults of our current system. So. Long story short, there are some significant differences and it'll be curious to see what these things mean when it comes to the marketplace. Uh, we've got some people, some of the uh, economists and some people out there predicting uh, a big impact, specifically people from the government. And you've got other who are say, others who are saying, we're seeing nowhere near enough supply, it doesn't really matter. And this is only addressing the demand related issue, which is not what we actually need. But I mean, there has to be a value or a benefit associated with the 30 year amortization and pushing people to give them the 30 year amortization on new build properties, incentivizing the market to be able to start to absorb some of these new builds that allows developers to get a little bit more cash in their pockets and really just start to take hold of some of that money that they haven't enjoyed for the better part of the last couple of years. Basically, my theory on this is. Yes, it is more government intervention. Yes, it is going to increase demand. No, it's not going to flip-flop the market completely. But when you combine this with interest rates going down and rates going, sorry, rates going down and the market shifting becoming more of a buyer's market, there are so many reasons to believe, and it's not me just saying this, that the economy is moving towards either a more balanced marketplace or in the next one to two years, we'll see the housing market start to rear its ugly head and come back from a price point perspective. Good news for all of those hoping for equity growth or being able to leverage up. Bad news for those looking for a housing crash. And yes, I'm looking at you, person on YouTube who likes to hate everything I do and I say and talk about the housing crash, you can keep waiting. Now, that doesn't mean for a fact that this fall is going to basically blow up and everything's are gonna, everything is going to start screaming and get busy. The reality of that is that we're in a marketplace right now where people are still trying to adjust to a higher cost of living. We have renewals coming up like crazy, which is impacting people's budgets and abilities to be able to spend discretionary money, including homes. And there's going to be an opportunity for people who are basically waiting on the sidelines to buy this fall before a lot of people do because these rules don't even take effect until December 15th. Now, we'll have more to unpack on this. I mean, I'll have more to unpack and a lot more to say this over the coming months and specifically into 2025, because there's no doubt that this is going to definitely generate a commotion. And people often underestimate the potential impact of just the psychology of the real estate market. Now, speaking of psychology of the real estate market, I alluded, it into the in, alluded into this in the intro, which was the fact that Mr. Jerome Powell decided to go ahead and cut rates He's the equivalent to TIFF at BOC here. Cut rates by 50 points. This is big news. Again, remember, the marketplace was calling for a quarter point. Now, you'd think that by them making that decision really quickly here, that would have a massive impact on the bond market. It did not. It was very slight. And if anything, it's rallied back since that time. But here's what they had to say. Coming out of their, like, their feedback, this is the things they said. The U.S. economy continues to expand at a solid pace. The labor market is in solid condition. Unemployment will reach only 4.4 by year end. Consumer spending is resilient. We don't think we're behind on rate cuts. The economy is basically fine and in good shape, but they just did a 50 point price reduction. And we've seen noticeable, a lot of different stats and information out there about the fact that their credit card spending is hitting record limits. And in addition to that, US uh, spending as a whole, like the government spending is out of control. They're in the greatest amount of debt they've ever been. So 
let's see here. So the economy is good, but I'm going to go ahead and cut by 50 points. Now, the question mark is, does he do that again? Where do things go from here? How does this impact the marketplace? And if I'm watching what's happening in the U.S., as we know, just like in Canada, it doesn't have a direct immediate correlation on U.S. mortgage rates. So we don't anticipate to have a major impact on people's desire or willingness to go out and spend money on housing. But it will wake some people up and it'll give people a little bit more positivity, just like it has in Canada, to get behind the housing market in this time, maybe getting people to start refinancing or restructuring or looking ahead to see what that could look like for them. So the impact on the Bank of Canada really at this point right now is if you're wondering and you well, you are Canadian, so you're probably wondering what's the impact back home? Well, the impact is really simple. It's going to give TIFF a little bit more ability or liberty, if you will, to adjust our own rates, especially in response to unemployment as unemployment is rising rapidly. Now, I'm going to go off a little bit on this, too, because in the last few weeks, I've definitely seen an employment factor come into our conversations. In fact, two of our clients who were previously approved were just recently laid off. Now, thankfully, as a mortgage broker, we had the ability to go and source some other lending, albeit at different terms, but they're not going to lose their home and their deposit, which was the most important consideration at the end of the day. And I'm not just seeing this, I'm hearing this among my peers. So the unemployment thing, albeit not everywhere, is significant. Moreover, I'm hearing about more and more people. Crazy enough, I've had four conversations from people in the last week, and this is just going on a random tangent here, who are from other countries, India, United States, and other countries that I don't even recall saying, you know what, we're done with Canada. We're not making enough money. It's too expensive here. We're out. So the question mark is, what happens first? Do we lose the labor force? Do we have more unemployment? Because that could keep the labor force intact and reduce the amount of unemployment. It's going to be curious to see how that goes. Now, Across the board, what is this impact on Canadian mortgage rates and what's going on? Now, you got to remember this. Pretty much all of the rate cuts from the BOC are basically front-loaded. So looking at where things are going, they usually will cut sooner than later when they see things going down, which basically means that we might see a steady stream, especially according to National Bank's quote here. They actually said they can. we can expect to see a steady stream of rate cuts ahead. And I mean, if you didn't already see the quotes from CIBC about seeing 125 basis points by January, at this point, there is no reason to believe that's not going to happen unless something significant comes up in the data in the next month or two. Another consideration, basically at this point right now, the whole market is screaming, take a variable rate. If you're doing a forward analysis in the marketplace, depending on your plans or your goals, there's no disadvantage to going variable. If nothing else, from the fact that you can take a variable rate mortgage, and this we're going to talk on the rate strategy piece, there's about six different strategies that we can consider. I'm just going to talk about one right now. And one strategy to consider is for those who who are even nervous about the rate market, remember this, the current rate market is predicting fixed rates. I'm just looking at a graph right now. Fixed rates decline over the course of the next year, nearly 1%. And if you were to sign in and renew today, even if you did take a variable rate, let's say at five and a half percent or five and three quarters. And if rates cut down, let's say 100 basis points by by January of next year, so that's four total in three rate cut opportunities, that would give someone a a ending rate of four and a half to 4.75. And by that time, we could see many fixed rates in the threes, the high threes and the low fours. That individual could convert into a lower fixed rate mortgage or just continue riding the the positivity of the variable rate mortgage. Now, don't discount hybrid options. There are hybrid options that people could consider as well, which is where you have a mortgage with a fixed rate and a variable rate. And if you really want to double down, I think I might put together a YouTube video specifically about this strategy. There are certain products out there where you can kind of hedge your bets and essentially set up a, a secured line of credit, use the secured line of credit to more or less prepay the mortgage and retake out money at a lower cost or rate. Now, this is a little bit of a judo strategy, and I think I'm going to put together a YouTube video. So if you're not on the YouTube channel, check it out, Flow Mortgage Co. on YouTube, or search up my name, Alex McFadden. And if you're on the YouTube, then definitely make sure to subscribe so you can see the strategy coming up in the next few weeks where I'll break down a consideration that you can use. Now, there's a little bit more to it that we won't be able to get into in the video, but I want to make sure to give you as much value as possible so that when you end uh, off, you know exactly what you can do. And if you want to work with my team and I, then we'll put it in place for you with uh, some other strategies that we know on top of that. Looking forward, what does this all mean? Really, I'm not going to go out and scream, boom, housing market is going to you know, go crazy. I'm not going to go out there and say, everybody's going to jump on the bandwagon. I'm not going to go out there and say anything like, like that. But what I am going to say is, 
these types of rules and guidelines are going to have an impact on demand. And at some point, all of those people sitting on the sidelines will want to get back in the marketplace. The question mark as to when is one that we don't know the answer to. Now, I'd love to hear your feedback here. If you want to post it in the comments below or send me a DM on Instagram, uh, what do you think the changes of the CMHC guidelines are going to be? Are they good? Are they bad? Are you going to take advantage of them? Let me know. I'd love to hear. And I look forward to seeing you on the next podcast. Again, if you enjoyed it, give us a like, give us a share. I'll see you on the next one. That was an unreal episode of The Flow. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did on my side right here. If you haven't already done so, make sure to check out all of the incredible resources that we have available. You can find us on Instagram at Flow Mortgage Co. You can find us on our website, getflowmortgage.ca. And of course, don't forget our free first time home buyer masterclass that's currently available on our website for anyone who listens to the episodes. And if you loved what you listened here today, the only thing that we ask for is to share this with someone else that you think this could help. And hey, maybe leave us a great review online.